Gotcha. Thank you for joining me for this live post. Uh, I'm your brother in faith, Shabir Ali. And uh, today I want to bring you an interesting uh, discussion. Uh, it's my review of uh, the uh, Counter Missionary Survival Guide by uh, Rabbi Michael Skobak. This was done many years ago. I have a copy here of, the, of this companion study guide. Um, and you can see it says the Jews for Judaism Counter Missionary Survival Seminar, uh, the definitive 12 audio tape series. <laughs> audio tape. <laughs> see how long this was, long, how long this was. Um, uh, okay, so um, Rabbi Michael Skobak is uh, from uh, Toronto, and uh, the address here given on this um, uh, printout is uh, Bather Street in, in Toronto. Um, so I came across this many years ago. This is uh, published 1995, and it's about that same time that I had actually begun uh, my work on um, debating with uh, with Christians. In fact, probably uh, 1995 was the first major public debate I had. That was with Tony Costa uh, at uh, the University of Toronto Medical Sciences uh, Auditorium. Uh, so, yeah, I was uh, just getting into it at that time, and I came across uh, this um, uh, book, and, well, I mean, if you call it a book, this is a more a study guide, a handout, and uh, the accompanying audio tapes. I, I still have the audio cassette tapes somewhere, I think, uh, but, you know, who, who listens to audio cassette tapes nowadays? Um, but a uh, good, good thing is that I noticed uh, recently that some of the uh, rabbis' uh, lectures, based on this uh, book, or, or the book that is based on the lectures, anyway, the lectures related to this uh, study guide uh, are available on, uh, on YouTube, so uh, they can be uh, uh, listened to for free, and that's, that's good. So, what's different about this? Many of us uh, recently have been aware of uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer, uh, who has done a lot more work, and eventually, inshallah, I will um, do a review of uh, Rabbi uh, Singer's, uh, uh, Tovia Singer's uh, work as well. But for the moment, I would say that uh, Rabbi Skobak's uh, work is, is more, uh, in a way, rudimentary, and uh, Rabbi Tovia's as you can say, whether it was based on, on this or not, uh, it's hard to know, uh, but I, I would think that, uh, you know, there, there are streams and currents, and uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer is part of that stream, that current of thought uh, that is represented here by um, uh, Rabbi Skobak's uh, work. So we can say that Rabbi Skobak is, uh, you know, in a way, a kind of a pioneer on this. Uh, responding to missionary. So basically, Rabbi Skobak is saying, look, uh, we're not a missionary faith, uh, so he's not trying to convert anyone. And at the same time, he's not uh, uh, trying to demean the religion of anyone. He's not uh, trying to critique another religion. Uh, he is just trying to respond to the uh, missionary onslaught on, on, on Jews. Like, uh, you know, missionaries come to Jews uh, and they say, okay, you know what, you've been reading your Torah and the rest of the Bible all your lives, but you haven't noticed certain verses of the, of the Bible, which we will now point out to you. And in particular, they will like to say, okay, so you were not uh, aware that Isaiah chapter 53 is actually speaking about uh, Jesus. So let's uh, look at that and show you that Isaiah 53 really is about Jesus and is about somebody dying on the cross. Or else, if it's not about Jesus, who else could it be? Uh, who would fit that uh, profile of somebody who is described like this in Isaiah chapter 53? So... Rabbi Skobak's work, as we will see later on with uh, Tovia Singer as well, uh, goes into detail regarding that to show that, no, the missionaries have misunderstood uh, the Old Testament and uh, really uh, the crucified Messiah, a trinity and uh, you know, salvation through the blood uh, uh, and atonement of, uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, all of this is uh, really not Judaism. And uh, it, it's, not, it's not really corresponding to the Old uh, Testament. What is very useful about uh, 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 Skobak's uh, work, if you can get hold of it, I don't know if you'd be able to get hold of this printout now, uh, because at that time they just had a P.O. Box number, and I don't know if the Jews for Judaism um, 
group is still working, but I see they have a website, www.jewsforjudaism.org. See, it's right there, uh, www.jewsforjudaism.org. So if you uh, look for that uh, website, you see, ignore my, the pen scratches at the bottom. I don't know, somebody was testing a pen or something like that. I must have had this lying around and uh, somebody saw it as open game and uh, started to test a pen to see if a pen writes or something like that. Um, yeah, so there is juiceforjudaism.org. So if you can get a hold of this, this is a very useful uh, guide. Um, for example, uh, we find here that, uh, you know, you have a list of uh, chapters and the chapters uh, are, you know, telling you what, what this deals with. So let's see. Uh, Missionary Impossible, the Battle for the Jewish Soul. So that's more, you know, for interest to Jews to say, okay, the Christians are coming at you. This is what this uh, study is all about. And then the real Messiah. So we're going to look at uh, the Old Testament and see what does it say really about the Messiah. And then that uh, goes to another session, which is session number three, uh, dealing with the miracles uh, that is expected of the, well, that are said to be done by the Messiah. And then session number four, uh, introduction to proof texting. So uh, hitting the bullseye. What Michael Skoback is saying is that uh, when Christian missionaries wanted to um, uh, prove that Jesus fits an Old Testament profile, they don't start with the profile and then see, okay, what exactly is this profile? And then see if Jesus really measures up to that. What they do is that they start with Jesus and then they go back to the Old Testament to find something that could somehow um, relate to to Jesus. Uh, and and then, so he, he says that this is backwards. It's almost like, uh, let's say you have a target and you're trying to shoot the arrow into the target and hit the bullseye. Well, let's say you've fired a few uh, shots and then, you know, it's not hitting the bullseye. So what you do is you leave the arrows where they are, uh, but you go and you draw the bullseye around the arrow. So, of course, you can say, look, my arrows hit the bullseye. But, of course, it's drawn after the fact. So, uh, Rabbi Skobach sees that a lot of the uh, texts which are quoted from the Old Testament are of this nature. They're, they're like, drawn after the fact. Um, the connection is made after the, after the fact. And then, uh, sin and sacrifice and atonement. Sin, sacrifice, and atonement. So, it's interesting to see how, um, you know, uh, the Old Testament really is interpreted. See, we had this idea that sin in the Old Testament is paid for by the sacrifices, right? But uh, what Rabbi Skobach and others are showing is that the Bible clearly says that these sacrifices were mainly for unintentional sins. As for intentionally done sins, you, you had to uh, repent for that, and, and the repentance was effective. So if somebody comes and says, no, you must have the blood shed in order for the forgiveness of sins to be effective, that's not correct because, well, it's not Old Testament anyway, uh, because the Old Testament actually shows that the blood sacrifices were for unintentional sins. Now, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, so a discussion about that. Daniel 9 and the 70 weeks, uh, part 1, part 2, because some say that uh, there is a mention of 70 weeks before, you know, the Messiah is cut off. And um, he traces the history and development of that idea. And Zechariah 12 uh, with Isaiah 9, uh, 6, Isaiah 9, 6 is often quoted, Micah 5, uh, and so on. All the passages are normally quoted. And then the idea of Satan and Trinity. So the idea of Satan is uh, very interesting to see a Jewish discussion of this because in the Old Testament, uh, Satan did not have the kinds of features that Satan seems to have uh, in Christianity and in Islam, but especially in Christianity. Because in Christianity, Satan takes on a very powerful role. It's as if, uh, you know, God has to bargain with Satan in, in giving his son up uh, on the cross to be sacrificed uh, so that Satan could let the people go. Uh, so that, that's, that's um, an unusual idea, and it doesn't gel with the Old Testament picture of the Satan. In the Old Testament, Satan... Uh, well, it appears to be like one of the sons of God, and uh, meaning among the angels, and he is shown to be an adversary, and he is apparently carrying out God's work, especially in his, uh, uh, you know, being let loose against Job, uh, in testing uh, Job. 
Uh, so a uh, very different portrayal than than in the New Testament and then in the in Islam, but more so in the New Testament. And then uh, the eternal Torah versus the New Testament parts one and two. So he's contrasting, you know, can be really uh, go with the New Testament after we have the uh, the uh, eternal Torah. Uh, so a, a very interesting discussion uh, from a Muslim point of view. What what would I say? I would say that this is uh, a very uh, I, I mean, we, I study a wide variety of materials. I, re I read books which are written by Christians. I read books which are written by atheists. I read books which are written by a wide variety of, uh, of followings. I read books on the world's religions. Uh, so it's, it's not only like books written by Muslims that, that I read. And uh, it's good to have this kind of well-rounded uh, view and to see things from different uh, angles. Uh, now, from a Muslim point of view, uh, Christians are close to us in one way, but Jews are close to us in another way. So Jews are close to us in, in one way, in that uh, they uh, believe in monotheism, and uh, Islam is strong about monotheism, whereas we have some question about the Christian idea of monotheism. Christians say they believe in one God, but the one God is in three persons, and then that starts to sound to Muslims as though you know we're talking really about three gods, uh, but in a disguised way. Uh, whereas with uh, Judaism, the monotheism is uh, clearer. Now, uh, at the same time, Muslims uh, have something in common with Christians that we don't have in common with Jews, and that's our belief in, Je our belief in Jesus and home be peace. Now, Christians um, historically have uh, contributed a lot to anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism, uh, with their idea that uh, the Jews killed n not only a human being, but God, in a way, so uh, or at least the Son of God. And that's, uh, you know, an unimaginable uh, crime from the Christian point of view. Um, Muslims do not regard Jesus on whom be peace as uh, God, and, uh, you know, regarding him as a Messiah means that the crime against him was of a le lesser um, uh, lesser degree. Moreover, from a Muslim uh, point of view, there is a difference in that, um, whereas in, in the Christian Bible, it, it is mentioned that the Jews said, let his blood be on, on our heads and, and on our children as well. Um, so that means the, the guilt for killing Jesus perpetuates through the generations. There's nothing like that in the Quran. Um, so we don't have to, you know, say that all Jews are blameworthy for this. One might be able to say, okay, if somebody is subscribing to the same set of beliefs and principles and attitudes uh, that caused people to uh, crucify Jesus in the first place, well, then they're equally blameworthy. But that's uh, probably hardly the case uh, nowadays because the attitude is a very important uh, aspect of that. And in modern times, we don't live with this attitude. Uh, at, at least I don't see this among Jews of today, uh, that they feel that they have to, uh, you know, stamp out um, a false belief and uh, to the extent of killing uh, one who comes and claims to be an emissary of, of God. So the, the landscape has changed. Uh, people's attitudes today are, you know, are, are different from the way that people view things, even in the Middle Ages. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, extend that so much uh, to people of this time. And uh, and so Muslims uh, not having something in the scripture that demands that we have this continual um, um, hatred uh, for another people, uh, this, uh, you know, it's, it's different from the Christian uh, position. So for two differences mainly. One is that we don't regard Jesus as being God. And two, we don't have a scriptural uh, mandate to think that whatever was done there in the time of Jesus is somehow transferred to the uh, later uh, generations of um, of of, Ju of, Ju of Jewish followers. Um, so having said that, uh, so how do we regard a work like this? So we, we have something in common with Christians, we have something in common with Jews, uh, more in common with Jews is the monotheism, more in common with Christians is uh, the belief in Jesus on whom be peace. And so we can learn something from both camps. Uh, from, from Christians, we can learn something about Jesus, how he present his message, presented his message, how he went about his work of uh, proving himself to be a, a prophet of God in his time, and how he was opposed by people who were determined to kill him. Um, on the other hand, we can learn from our Jewish uh, friends 
uh, how to interpret the Old Testament, at least to a certain extent. We wouldn't go to the extent of saying, okay, so we side with them now, and uh, that means we're going to reject Jesus as well. Um, no, in fact, some Jews of modern times uh, may actually regard Jesus as a prophet of God, uh, maybe in a certain way, and uh, maybe they will uh, think that some of the teachings which are mentioned about Jesus in the New Testament are not authentic uh, teachings about Jesus, and if we were to peel back all of these teachings and get back to the core of what Jesus himself taught, then maybe we'll see that Jesus is just like one of the Old Testament uh, prophets. Okay, he claimed to be the Messiah. Uh, they were not so convinced about that, but that doesn't make him a false uh, prophet because from their point of view, a lot of people will claim to be messiahs, and that doesn't make a person necessarily, like it's not a make or break thing. A person says he's the messiah, they watch around and see, maybe he will rule or maybe not. If he rules, maybe that means that he's the messiah. If he doesn't rule, I guess that means he's not the messiah. So they had the wait and see attitude. And some of them are still saying, okay, we'll wait and see. If you say that Jesus is the messiah, we'll come back and rule in the future. Maybe we'll believe in him then. Uh, but uh, for, in the meantime, it doesn't look to us like he was the, the Messiah. But that's, that's not the same as being false prophet, um, because one could uh, be a good man and, and still you know, have false messianic expectations uh, for himself. Um, so uh, well, we, we stand then in between, and we can benefit from this work. So how might we benefit? Uh, one of the chief, chief benefits I see in this work is that you will see, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, um, the uh, very important verses dealing with, uh, with certain questions. Like, let's say, for example, we're dealing with Trinity. So we go to session number nine, and um, it's, uh, it's a bit, uh, the, the page numbers are not mentioned in the, in the uh, initial um, contents page there. So we have to kind of like uh, read through it here to see where the next uh, session begins. So this is Daniel 9, 70 weeks. And then soon after that, we'll come to uh, Satan and the Trinity. And that's it, Satan and the Trinity. So let's say the Trinity. So you want to find verses. You will see right in a nutshell, like verses uh, one after another uh, are presented uh, so that you can see at a glance where the verses are. So you see only the chapter number Deuteronomy 4, but right under that, verse number 35 Unto you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. Uh, so that's a statement of monotheism. And again, in verse number 39, Know therefore this day, and consider it in your heart that the Lord, he is God, uh, in heaven above and upon the earth uh, beneath. There is none else. Uh, and then we go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Then we go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. See now uh, that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Then Isaiah 42. I am the Lord. That's in verse number 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Isaiah 43, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Uh, Isaiah 40, yeah, so it goes on and on. And so you can see the chapter numbers and the verse numbers of the most uh, relevant passages that will uh, uh, you know, support your, your case. And you can see there's a whole page load of them. Uh, in two columns, and then it's not done. We go to the next page, and we have more of the same. Um, from Numbers chapter 23, verse number 19. This is one of my favorites. I quote this a lot in debates. Uh, God is not a man that uh, he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Ha has he said, and shall he not do it? Or has he spoken, and shall he not make it good? So God is not a man. It's very clear there. And, uh, you know, so uh, th this is where Christ Muslims can benefit, and of course Christians as well, uh, by seeing all of those verses uh, at, at a glance. And then we go to the New Testament as, uh, as well. So we go to the New Testament, because one might uh, say, well, okay, that's the Old Testament, but Jesus came and he presented himself as God. Look at Mark chapter 20, uh, 10, 
verse 17, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why call you me good? There is none good but one, that is God. And then uh, Mark chapter 13, verse number 31, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knows no man, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So that Mark chapter 13, verse number 32, has proven quite, quite a stumbling block uh, for uh, those who assert the divinity of Jesus. Because if he's saying that he doesn't know when the hour will occur, then that proves that he's not the omniscient God. And, and that's a real problem. So you have, uh, you know, statements like, like this all on the same page. So it is uh, very uh, easy uh, to grasp, very easy to um, present. If you were doing a presentation, let's say you wanted to give a public lecture or you wanted to do a debate yourself, uh, then you will uh, have all of the uh, verses at your fingertips. So let's go to sin, sacrifice and atonement. Uh, Sin, sacrifice, and atonement. I'll I'll be debating with Anthony Rogers in a in a week's time. That's next uh, next Saturday, actually, less than a week. Uh, so some of these uh, passages will come in useful to me. So you know that's the chapter there on sin, sacrifice, and atonement. When we turn the page, what do we find? Verses upon verses that deal with the with the subject. Um, and uh, we find, for example, in Leviticus chapter 17, uh, for uh, Leviticus chapter 17, where are you? There you are. Leviticus chapter 17, verse number 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Uh, the important thing here is that the blood is making atonement, but it's not the only way of making atonement. And uh, he shows that there are other ways in which uh, one can uh, atone for one's sins. For example, in Leviticus 17 again, uh, verse number 10, uh, what, it say, what does it say here? Uh, if any one of the house of Israel or of the aliens who reside among them eats my, any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut that person off from the people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to, to you for making atonement for your lives on the altar. As life, uh, for as life, it is in the blood that makes atonement. Uh, so, and then it continues, uh, and it shows that there are other ways um, that you can uh, make atonement. Uh, so, what what is also important here is to notice that the uh, blood was supposed to be something like you you can't imbibe, and and. Somehow it so happens in, in later thought that people are thinking, okay, let's uh, drink this wine and let's assume that this is the blood of, uh, of Jesus. Leviticus chapter 4, verse number 22. When a ruler uh, sins, when a ruler sins, doing unintentionally, you see the word unintentionally there. When, the ruler, when a ruler sins, doing unintentionally any one of the things that by commandments uh, of the Lord... Uh, his God ought not to be done and incurs guilt. Uh, once the sin that he has committed is made known, to, made known to him, he shall bring his offering. So that's when he brings the offering. It's for an in, unintentional uh, sin. And of course, there's a guilt offering on the day of uh, atonement, but that guilt offering, as uh, is explained further, uh, is by, by actually explained by Rabbi Tovia Singer. I was just listen, looking at his um, Let's Get Biblical this morning. Uh, then he uh, uh, that um, th that that guilt offering was for you know uh, uh, violating the the sanctity of the temple, and uh, when the temple is no longer there, then that guilt offering, according to Rabbi Tovia Singer, uh, is no longer applicable. Uh, Rab uh, Leviticus chapter five shows that actually you can bring flour. It doesn't have to be blood. So Leviticus chapter 5, verse number 7, But if you cannot afford a sheep, you shall bring to the Lord, as your penalty for the sin that you have committed, two turtle doves or two pigeons, uh, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. You shall bring them to the priest, who shall offer first the one uh, for the sin offering, wring its head and the nape without severing it, and so on. And then verse number 12 
um, uh, let's say with verse number 11. But if you cannot afford two turtle loves or two pigeons, you shall bring as your offering for the sin that you have committed one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. You shall not put oil on it or lay frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. You shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall scoop up a handful of it as a, its memorial portion, and turn this into smoke on the altar with the offerings by fire to the Lord. It is a sin offering. And then verse number 13, Thus the priest shall make atonement on your behalf for whichever of these sins you have committed, and you shall be forgiven. No, that's a very important statement, you know. So, so if somebody's saying, no, you, you have to get the blood sacrifice, otherwise you cannot get the forgiveness of sins, it says right there in Leviticus chapter 5, verse number 13, that after you present this offering of flour, you will be forgiven. So, uh, in short, uh, that's a very useful um, uh, set of lectures. Uh, you can find them uh, on YouTube, uh, inshallah. At least I stumbled upon a few of them recently, so they, they, they missed, I hope they're all there. Uh, otherwise, get some, get the cassettes from somebody, and uh, you know, if they're still in cassette form, uh, then uh, try to, you know, find a way to legally um, uh, set them out to onto a modern uh, way that uh, people can make can have access to them, maybe by by YouTube or something like this. So, uh, Rabbi Michael Skobak, his uh, counter missionary uh, survival guide, uh, it was presented in audio cassette lectures. And uh, it, uh, this is the handbook that goes with it. As, as you can see, it was published in 1995. It was a long time ago. But that was the time when I started uh, debating with our Christian friends in public. And um, this uh, has actually proved useful to me over uh, the years. So that's what I, all I want to say about that um, um, work by Michael Skoback today. And uh, I would open up uh, for your questions and comments. Uh, so let me uh, uh, set this up so I can see your comments uh, very easily, uh, close to the close to the camera. So here we are. Yes. Okay. So. Your questions and comments. Uh, Abu Hamid Al Ghazali, what a famous and popular name. Uh, assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi Muhammad Riaz Hussain saying assalamu alaikum, sir, and wa alaikum assalam. And uh, my brother Much, uh, uh, Much, uh, Muhammad Mustafa uh, Dushirovich, per forgive me if I mispronounce your name, brother, and uh, saying, mashallah, I'm benefiting a lot from your vast knowledge. May Allah reward you abundantly. I'm okay. Uh, thank you, my brother. May Allah Taala bless you and reward uh, you as well for all your good work and bless all of the people around you. Dennis, Allah Shabir, you said that sacrifice is for unintentional sin. For intentional sin, we have to repent. In your view, is every sin of us on in, uh, uh, is every sin on, uh, of us intentional? Don't we sin unintentionally much more often? If yes, we depend on the sacrifice, don't we? Okay, that's a, uh, yeah, that's an important point, uh, Dennis. Yes, we do a lot of unintentional sins. Uh, so, how do we get forgiveness for that in Islam? Uh, so, the unintentional sins, we believe, are the easiest ones to be forgiven because, you know, God knows that we are human beings, we are forgetful, we're not paying attention a lot, and, uh, you know, we do things without cold calculation. And even in our legal systems, I mean, things which are done without cold calculation are looked at differently, like there is intentional murder, and then there is manslaughter, which is, you know, like you hit somebody, you didn't intend to kill him, but the guy died. Um, that's different from like a cold calculated murder, and so on. So, you know, things are treated according to intention. In a famous hadith, it is mentioned, the innamal amalu bin niyat. The actions are judged by intention. So that's, uh, you know, the Islamic side of it. And then uh, more than the Islamic side, we believe that uh, the minor sins, and these would be definitely minor sins because they're unintentional, the, the minor sins would, you know, fall away when a person prays or when a person even washes before the prayer. And on so many different uh, occasions, God just seems to be looking for an excuse to just do away with all of these. 
And uh, in fact, in the Quran, it is even said that uh, if you avoid the main things that God prohibited, then God will forgive you the rest, and uh, and so on. So there, there is all of that from the Islamic point of view. Now, uh, one, let's look at it from the biblical point of view then, and say that okay, so you need these sacrifices for the unintentional sins, and um, now, so. What, what are we to do with the unintentional sins? Because we have so many, as you're pointing out, Dennis. Well, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, Christians continued to offer sacrifices in the temple uh, up until 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. And so uh, it, uh, Christians did not seem to have the idea that, uh, you know, we, we, the sacrifice of Jesus does away with the, the sacrifices of the Old Testament. Uh, that that's a, a later developing idea. Of course, it was already proposed by Paul in a way, but Paul himself is shown to have been uh, continuing the sacrifices in, in the temple, as we can see from Acts chapter 21. So let's say now we, we think about, of it from a Jewish point of view and the Jews are thinking, okay, so, you know, the unintentional sins, um, what are we going to do about them now uh, that we don't have the temple and we can't perform the sacrifices? Uh, well, uh, they can turn to the other ways of seeking forgiveness of God, knowing that uh, you know God is not going to demand of them more than what they're capable of. If the temple is not there, and all of the instructions about these sacrifices were dependent on the existence of the temple, uh, they can excuse themselves by saying, okay, we don't have the temple, so we don't have to do what was dependent upon the existence uh, of the temple. So, But it's an interesting question. I, I appreciate your, your uh, thought about that. And it is something that we can continue to think about more and discuss some more. Okay, Salubwa, Salam Alaikum, Dr. Shabir. There is a story where the Jews had been advised whether to check if the Prophet is true or not. So during the time of Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, the Jews did this test on Prophet Muhammad, but he wasn't able to clear it uh, because the test passed by an Israeli prophet, whereas Prophet Muhammad was an Arabic prophet. So Jews have a strong reason to deny the Prophet, right? Well, from the Quranic point of view, you know, they do not have a strong reason for denying because uh, the Quran, it, you know, shows that uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a char charismatic leader. Uh, he was uh, in every way demonstrating to be, uh, demonstrating himself to be a prophet, the messenger of God, and people who reject him are therefore in error for having uh, rejected him. Now, if one is going to be a judge based on the Old Testament, one is going to say, look, we have our Old Testament, this is uh, authentic, and it says that the Messiah must be a king. Uh, well, uh, and, and not only a king, but he must be from among the Israelites themselves, and because a king has to be from the Israelites themselves. Uh, well, then, that's reading too much into uh, the, uh, you know, the prophecies which are in the Old Testament. Uh, and uh, in, in any case, the Quran does not accept that the Old Testament is 100% uh, preserved. So one would have to have good reason for thinking that the Old Testament is 100% preserved in the first place in order to use that as the benchmark uh, for um, uh, deciding if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the Prophet of God in every detail. But if one takes the Old Testament in a general way, uh, then one will see that it speaks about prophets to come in the future, and there is no reason for denying the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as having that role. If the Old Testament had said very clearly in an undisputed manner that uh, there is no other prophet to come, well then, yes, uh, we will say the, anyone who comes and claims to be a prophet cannot be one. But there is no such verse in the, in the Old Testament. As for the verse which says that, you know, the kings must be from, uh, the king that will be like Moses must be from among the Israelites, uh, well, then, you know, that's akin to other verses uh, of the Bible which, uh, Praise the Israelite nation and seems uh, to and, and seem to reserve the greatness for the Israelite uh, nation. That must be seen as the history written by the winners and not necessarily true in fact. So, if uh, people were being uh, really honest with their scriptures, they might have recognized the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a prophet of God and uh, history would have evolved uh, differently. That, that, that's, of course, the Muslim point of view. Some others may um, have a difference of opinion with me. Okay, I see that uh, Tuan uh, Idris, uh, my friend, is here. Uh, I didn't see you. Okay, so you're replying to uh, Salu. So I think that's not true. It was Abdus Salam, the Jewish rabbi in Medina, who accepted Islam on meeting the uh, Holy Prophet, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thank you for that uh, comment, Brother uh, Tuan. 
And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you soon, inshallah. Salut. Uh, uh, 355, when Allah said, Oh Jesus, indeed, I will pick your soul and raise you to myself and purify uh, you from those who disbelieve and make those who follow you superior to those who disbelieve until the resurrection. Who is Allah talking uh, about when he says those who follow you, that is Jesus? It can be, can't be Muslims because we follow Prophet Muhammad and uh, Allah has said that they, those who follow Jesus will remain in a dominant position till the day of uh, uh, judgment. Is Allah speaking about Christians? Now, Salo, uh, we are in fact followers of Jesus on whom be peace as well. Of course, uh, the, the followers of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who are also followers of Jesus, did not exist at that time, um, at the time of Jesus or immediately after he was taken away, which is the context of Surah 3, verse number 55. But if we think of the followers of Jesus um, as, as a large set, then that set includes Muslims as well. So it, it starts out with those who were uh, disciples of Jesus on whom be peace and it, you know, the early Christians after him and it includes even Muslims for this time. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, um, that he's going to make those who follow Jesus uh, over those who um, disbelieved in him, uh, then, you know, that would include the Muslims uh, as, as well. Uh, Omar Nizam, uh, Bart Ehrman is uh, in one of his books states that for religion to be appreciated by the masses, it needs to be old, ancient, otherwise it's not taken very seriously. Hence, why the form of Christianity we have today survived and thrived, but uh, Jewish Christianity did not. Can the success of the religion of Islam from a historical non-theological perspective also be attributed to the fact that it was tethered to Judaism and uh, Christianity? Okay, uh, so you're saying from a non-historical, from a, a non-theological, from a historical and and therefore a non-theological perspective, can can the success of Islam be attributed to the fact that it was there tethered to the um, other religions, Judaism and Christianity? Well, from a historical point of view, it might be evaluated that way. But uh, then again, uh, then again. Uh, Islam uh, stood in contrast with the with the two. Uh, so you know, if the if the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was not a true prophet of God, like why would he go to the trouble of uh, insisting on a, a such a varied religion? Uh, he could uh, have just aligned himself with one of the ancient groups if the you know the antiquity of the teachings is what is really the you know the, the culminating point here. Uh, but the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, dared to differ with uh, the religions of the time in, in major ways. And uh, that, uh, to me, shows that he was being guided. He, he could not have foreseen success just uh, plodding along as, as he is doing. Um, in fact, William Montgomery Watt, in his book, Muhammad, Prophet and Statesman, says that uh, in the Meccan phase, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, would not have continued uh, if, if this was all from a human point of view, because uh, from his human point of view, there was uh, would have been no uh, apparent means of, of succeeding. Uh, but uh, it is only pro the Prophet Muhammad's sincerity, his belief that this was a revelation given to him from the Almighty God that helped him to keep uh, going. Dennis, uh, you just mentioned Leviticus 5 and referred to verse 13. Have you also considered what the priests had to do? Uh, that is explained in chapter 6 to 8. There you will see that without blood, nothing is uh, complete. Okay, Dennis, there's uh, something that uh, I will be studying uh, some more. I have to confess that uh, in my immediate memory, you know, I don't, uh, you know, recall the details of chapters uh, 6 to 8. Um, but but I'm, I'm sharing with you what uh, the, the rabbis are saying, and it's not only rabbis, I stumbled upon recently a, a website written by a Christian, I mean the articles therein are, are written by a Christian, and uh, he was dealing specifically with Hebrews chapter 9 verse number 13, I don't remember where the website is, but I can, uh, I, I will want to look it up again and study it some more, but he was also saying that, uh, you know, there are other ways of seeking forgiveness, which is by a contrite heart, a broken spirit, and, uh, you know, he mentioned also Levit Leviticus uh, chapter 5, verse 13, about the flower. He mentioned also charity, and, um, and, and he, he, it's quite clear that even as a Christian, he would concede that, uh, 
uh, the blood sacrifice is not the only way of achieving uh, forgiveness. Uh, so, um, yeah, there's, there's more for me to study, but uh, I think that's, that's a pretty firm conclusion, that is that there are other ways of achieving uh, forgiveness, uh, you know, uh, rather than blood sacrifice. Okay, Jim Martin, Salam Alaikum. Can you please explain the thick elements of shirk? Uh, does a uh, person have to know that they're attributing partners to Allah? Um, well, with, with most sins, uh, uh, Jim, one does not have to know that one is committing a sin in order for it to be a sin. If there's a law and one violates the law, even in ignorance, then it is still a sin. Of course, if one is ignorant, uh, then uh, you know it might be considered to be a lesser sin, depending on the um, nature and you know the crime and so what it is and so on. Um, so as for a shirk, um, yeah, attributing someone else as uh, a partner with God, uh, an associate of God, uh, you know, showing that God has an equal and so on, all of this is considered to be shirk in, in, the, in the Islamic uh, faith, whether one knows that one is doing it or not. And then uh, Omar Nizam, uh, so uh, something looks puzzling to me here. It looks like Jim is replying to Jim. I think of my parents who were devout Christians, but, uh, oh, I see. So you're, you're expanding upon your own comments. You're thinking of your parents who were devout Christians, but knew nothing about Islam and strict monotheism. So, so this is a different issue, Jim, uh, my brother. The uh, Muslim scholars have said that, you know, those who were born in such a circumstance where that's all they knew, you know, they, they just um, did what they knew. So they, they wouldn't be as blameworthy as the, I mean, they would be no, I'm, I'm saying as they worthy. Uh, actually, they said that, that those people will be excused. They, they will be excused uh, because they didn't know. They were not in a position to know. So, so that's, that's, I think, a key ingredient here. Are people in a position to know? So uh, let's say, you know, we, uh, I, I, I park my car in a, in a place where the, 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 there is no sign showing that uh, it is illegal to park there. Well, the city won't go after me, even if they, uh, you know, put a, put a ticket on my windshield. I can contest it because I can say, "Oh, look, you know, there were no clear signs, so there's no way that I could have known." Uh, but let's say they put the sign, but I didn't bother to look at the sign, and I parked there. And uh, later on, I say, "You know, I didn't know that parking was prohibited then." Well, the, the, the reply from the court will be that you are in a position to know; you should have known because there is a sign clearly posted. Now, for some people, uh, the, the sign is not clearly posted about uh, the difference between monotheism and, uh, and tritheism and uh, the mon monotheism and shirk and so on. So people follow what they have been brought up in, in the context and the environment in which they were born and so on. Uh, and uh, they, they, they're not really in a position to know any better. Now, we can't judge who is in a position to know and who is not in a position to know. Uh, only God can judge that. But we can have, uh, you know, some uh, inkling, some idea. Uh, and, and we, we you know, we're sensible people. We can uh, judge and see that in some situations, people really did not know or were not in a position to know. Our Muslim scholars in particular, some of those who are most uh, orthodox uh, uh, they said that uh, as for the people who lived uh, you know, some generations after the Council of Nicaea and before the preaching of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they will be excused for their belief in the Trinity because that's all they knew. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bless you, uh, Brother Jim, and your family, and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, show you on the Day of Judgment uh, that he has done everything with justice and fairness and, and wisdom. And uh, may you not be disappointed by the results that you see on that great day. Okay, uh, Brother Omar Nizam, uh, in today's a day and age, do you feel that all of us who are believers, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, should set aside the theological debates and prepare ourselves for the challenges that are being posed by historical, critical scholars of the Bible and the Quran? I think you have a point there, uh, Brother Omar. Uh, atheism is uh, really um, raising its head in our modern times. And uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims have to band together to answer uh, atheism. Uh, and uh, that means also that uh, we may have to come to the defense of each other as uh, people of religion and, and defend the faiths of each other. At the same time, there is uh, a certain uh, room available for us to 
uh, think about theological issues, to discuss these issues, and to be more clear about important theological issues. So in Islam, one of the important theological issues is the view of Tawhid or monotheism. So this is not something that we can give up from, for the sake of uh, unity. Yes, we might lay that aside for the moment, because in a certain context, it will be out of place to discuss that, we'll just spoil the atmosphere or whatever. But uh, we need to create the avenues in which we can still have that discussion uh, for the sake of God. Okay, Farhan, uh, Assalamu alaikum, Brother Shabir, stay always blessed, and you too, my brother Farhan, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, and all of the people uh, of Bahrain, I believe it is, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa protect you all. Uh, Omar Islam, question, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, seem to indicate that the Hebrew Bible did not undergo much change between what it was 2,000 years ago and what we have today. At what point, then, do you feel it may have been corrupted as per what the Quran states? So would it perchance be some time uh, before the 6th century B.C.? Uh, um, the Babylonian exile, which is what historians feel is the time the Bible was actually compiled. So, uh, Brother uh, Omar, the corruption could have been like continuous throughout the ages, but most of that could have been at the time when the Bible was being transmitted in oral form. Of course, the written form of the Bible from the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, to now, 2,000 years later, has basically remained uh, quite stable. Uh, but prior to that, uh, I've already dealt in a previous uh, lecture on uh, about, uh, I've dealt with uh, the uh, theories regarding the composition of the Torah uh, from different sources. I refer to the work of Richard Elliot Smith. Um, he has a book entitled Who Wrote the Bible? And most uh, recently, the book that I dealt with, The Bible with its Sources uh, Revealed. Salu Salman, Dr. Shabir, the Judaism calendar uh, states that this year is 5780 and the prophet Adam was present in, on earth like 5780 years ago. Then, how come that scientists have been finding evidences that humans are present on earth for a long time, uh, for more than 10, uh, more than 100,000 years ago? So, and naturally, uh, scientists would not regard the biblical dating as uh, being scientific, and uh, many uh, Christians and, and Jews would regard their dating as well uh, to not uh, be meant exhaustively, to be exhaustive. Uh, the generations which are listed uh, may not be a complete list, uh, because when you know, one says that uh, this person begot that one, maybe they meant that uh, despite many generations being past, uh, this is the next uh, descendant, um, and, and God knows best. In the, in the Quran, we don't have this difficulty because the Quran does not mention uh, the, uh, the generations in sequence and does not mention uh, the length of each generation. So to be very clear, the Bible says this person lived for so many years and then had this son, and then that son lived for so many years and then had that son, and then that's and so on. Uh, whereas the Quran does not have that, so we cannot calculate uh, the uh, time when Adam existed based on on the Quran. Um, this calculation is based on the Bible only, and as you've rightly pointed out, this is not scientific. Okay, Omar Nizam, and this is the last question I see here. I'm not moderating your comments, so I'm, I should be seeing them all, and. Um, and this is the last one, and then uh, we'll be done for today. Omar Nizam, I'm a bit puzzled by the idea or, or role of a chosen people. What is the point of a chosen people if a prophet has been sent to each and every nation since the beginning of creation? So, uh, the, uh, uh, Brother Omar, it seems to me that the idea of the chosen people in the Bible is not so much uh, that this one people is uh, are somehow, you know, favored by God, because God's favors are with all people. But uh, they, they have been chosen in a particular way for a particular covenant. God is giving them a, a responsibility, and they have been chosen for that responsibility. So they have to fulfill their end of the bargain in order to uh, retain that status as a chosen people. Even uh, Otherwise, even the Bible says that uh, that will be taken away and given to another people, and uh, God knows best. So that brings me to the end of uh, my discussion with you for today. Join me again uh, next week, God willing, uh, for another such. And uh, in the meantime, do look for the announcements regarding my debate with Anthony Rogers uh, to be held next Saturday. It'll be in the, in the afternoon in, uh, in Toronto, uh, but you will check the local times uh, elsewhere. Probably it'll be like 3.30 in the afternoon in, in Toronto. Um, but watch for the announcements, uh, which will probably will be on my Facebook page, or um, check with uh, Anthony Rogers and his pages 
and uh, Ministry to Muslims. I believe that's the organization that's uh, hosting it all with uh, Pastor George Saig. Uh, so look for announcements that may come from that source as well. So in the meantime, do support the humble work which I try to do for the sake of Allah to promote his message worldwide. You can do so by going to my, uh, the website of the organization uh, that I represent. That's the Islamic Information and Dawah Center International. And uh, there you can click on the donate button and send us a donation to help our mission. Or if you remember my name better than that long Islamic Information and Dawah Center, it's actually it's simple in terms of the website. It's islaminfo.com. But if you want to uh, go to my website, uh, shabirali.com, same result. Click on the donate page and uh, you can send a donation. You can also send me a question, which I will try to answer for you. So, uh, Jazakumullah Khairan, thank you for joining me today. May Allah SWT bless you, protect you, all of the people around you. May Allah SWT protect you all and us all from COVID-19, from every other disease and sickness and distress and stress. We ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to reopen the places uh, of uh, worship uh, so that we can worship you, Ya Rabb, in a way that is safe for us and pleasing to you. Open up the places of Hajj and Umrah uh, so that we can visit those and take us there uh, in a way that is pleasing to you and safe for us, Ya Rabb. Uh, I, uh, ya Rabb, we ask you, Ya Arhamar Rahimin, to look into the hearts of everyone who has joined us today. We all each have needs and desires, Ya Rabb, O oh Allah. We ask you to look at our hearts and see what we need and desire and wish. If these are in harmony with your goodwill and uh, your pleasure, and uh, if these are beneficial for us in this life and the life hereafter, then grant us the fulfillment of these. Otherwise, we ask you to bring us the good from wherever it is and make us happy with that, Ya Arhamar Rahimin. Subhanahu wa rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. That's it for today. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you.